We've got uh, three of us presenting today. I am one of the presenters. I'm Mark Mullins, as I mentioned. I am a member of the Ethernet Alliance. I'm on the marketing committee for the Ethernet Alliance and uh, been working with those guys for uh, about a year. And uh, it's a pretty cool thing. We got some cool stuff to tell you about that. We've also got some product information. So I brought Eric Webb, who is one of our product managers for our Essential Tools products. And those are ones probably most of you have seen. They're products like our Cable IQ and Teletone, some of our Tone and Probe products. And Eric's been managing those products for a few years now, and he's become quite an expert in all of those sorts of tools. And finally, I have uh, David Tremblay on the phone, and he's gonna kick us off. David's the systems architect at Aruba, which is Hewlett Packard Enterprises networking division. He's their power over ethernet subject matter expert. And he is leading uh, cross-functional teams for new product opportunities, driving network technologies into multiple HP product organizations. That all sounds very interesting, but uh, what I'm most interested in is the fact that he is definitely a world-class expert on power over ethernet and the chair of the Gen 2 committee at uh, the Ethernet Alliance. So David, why don't we start out with you and have you tell us a little bit about what you're doing, but first, I'm gonna show an agenda. David will start us off. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about PoE cabling considerations. Come on, it's a Fluke Networks presentation. Of course, we're gonna talk about cable. And finally, Eric is going to talk a little bit about installing and troubleshooting PoE and talk about this cool announcement that we've got for one of our products. All right, so now, David, I'm going to let you take it away. Perfect, thanks, Mark, appreciate it. So welcome, everyone. Uh, again, this is, my name is David Tremblay. Uh, I am the chair of the Power of Ethernet Certification Program within Ethernet Alliance, and all um, I wanted to give everyone an update uh, on the Gen 2 um, PoE certification program that we recently launched in the market this year uh, as a follow-on to um, its original certification uh, that was released uh, three years ago. Uh, but before I get into those details, what I'd like to provide is just a an overview of who the Ethernet Alliance is and um, what we do um, in terms of industry um, promotion. So first, first off, I'll start with our mission. Um, so Ethernet Alliance is a global community of end users, system vendors, and component suppliers in academia. Uh, our mission is to promote the industry awareness, acceptance, and advancement of technology and products based on our dependent upon um, the uh, emerging IEEE 802.3 Ethernet standards uh, and their management. So uh, essentially, um, what I'm going to talk about today is the 802.3 uh, power over Ethernet technology uh, and how that uh, has been uh, adopted in the marketplace and uh, where the certification um, is useful for validating those systems and devices. So here's our current uh, list of membership. And uh, it's just a, just a quick visual to highlight. We have several um, companies participating, whether they're principal members or um, associate members. Um, and, and we also have um, consulting members, which are, which are mostly the academia side. Uh, but there's a very wide variety of, of, of industry um, companies that are participating in the Ethernet Alliance. Next slide. So, ex so Ethernet Alliance, um, again, uh, how the Ethernet Alliance participates in um, the industry. Oh, sorry, Mark, if you can go back a slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so how, do, how does the Ethernet Alliance participate in the market? The, this kind of is a slide set that just shows um, some very high level um, participation activities. Whoops, the slide keeps advancing. Um, there we go, now you're on. Yeah, so I apologize. Slides. I don't know why it's doing that. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, we um, so we facilitate interoperability testing. That's our one of our main um, um, uh, feature um, uh, features that we offer that allow customers uh, or members to participate across the industry. So we have a Plugfest event typically at a single location where several company representatives show up with their devices and test for interoperability. Um, and then we also um, collaborate 
quite a bit on um, different uh, uh, technologies, for example, um, multi-source agreements or MSAs, um, industry consensus building, where we pull pull everyone together to, to kind of drive standard um, technologies um, moving forward. Um, obviously, the POE certification program is a culmination of all of that, where we bring together both interoperability and took this taking the standards and um, put together a, a validation test matrix um, to to certify power of Ethernet products. And then we also have various um, global outreach and thought leadership activities, um, as well as promotional. Um, uh, areas where we talk about, uh, we have industry analysts and um, education and marketing um, pu putting together things like this, webinars or, or other trade show and panel presentations. So uh, very active in, in the industry for promoting Ethernet. And then um, this is one of our um, roadmap uh, overview slides. So th these are roadmaps that we put together every year showing the Ethernet technology. Uh, sorry, Mark, if you can back up one, I know it's, it may keep doing that. So if you could try to, um, if you see it fast forward, uh, I'll try to try to highlight the, to jump back. The, so the roadmap, you can go download um, directly from our website. Uh, we also, um, when we had live trade shows, instead of um, online webinars, uh, we would pass out pamphlets um, that you could pick up. So if you happen to see an Ethernet Alliance booth at some point in the future, uh, when we're back to live uh, trade shows, feel free to stop by and grab a pamphlet. Otherwise, you can always go directly to our website and download um, an Ethernet technology roadmap. So next slide. So getting into a little bit of, of why I was asked to come in and speak. So um, talking about power over Ethernet. And um, one of the main, uh, this is a survey that we the Ethernet Alliance completed back in January 2020, and um, it, it, it shows a very kind of high level of power over Ethernet devices that um, are already deployed in the market, as well as um, providing a, kind of an expectation of, of devices that might be deployed within the next 12 months. And one of the things um, I wanted to highlight is this, this survey results uh, were from uh, 822 respondents that we received, 48% um, of them were uh, system installers and integrators, 30% uh, of them were end users, and 14% were designers. Um, but the main takeaway here um, that I wanted to leave you with is that virtually everyone is installing and using Power over Ethernet, and we also have a, a very wide variety of Power, Power over Ethernet devices, as well as applications for PoE deployment growing in the future. So next slide. So a little bit about PoE and confusion in the marketplace. Um, you, technology tends to be a little confusing and, and with IEEE standards, we we had uh, for Power over Ethernet, at least we, we released three different standards. Um, one of them was uh, IEEE 802.3 AF, which was released back in 2003. Um, and it really focused on a two pair power over Ethernet system uh, up to a maximum of, of about 15.4 watts. And then um, in 2009, we released IEEE 802.3 AT, which is again a follow on to that same two pair um, power over Ethernet system uh, specification, but grew the wattage um, up to about 30 watts. And, and then finally, um, in 2018, we, we ratified the uh, what we believe will be the final power of Ethernet standard, which is 802.3BT. And that focuses on a four pair power de delivery system up to 99 watts, but uh, also is backwards compatible with the previous two standards and um, offers a two pair power delivery system as well. So even just talking through that, you, you might be confused as to why are so many standards, what does all this mean? And so, um, you know, some of the some of the confusion points are noted here below. There's several different wattages, there's different classes, some are two pair systems, some are four pair systems. Um, the industry has used a variety of naming conventions to describe these standards like PoE, PoE++, they have seen UPoE. Um, all of this adds to the confusion. Um, and then there's also uh, LLDP, which is a data link layer classification for power negotiations. 
Um, and so you might be wondering how, how with, with this amount of different specifications and terminology, um, how can we ensure that it's interoperable? Because that's at the end of the day, that's what IEEE standards um, are, are intended to promote is a, a standard for um, highly interoperable solutions. So, so with that, let me just jump over to um, one more slide highlighting um, a little bit about the, um, the issues or, or concerns that the industry has seen around PoE. So four out of five designers, installers, and users have reported problems with PoE. And even though we say they're, they're problems, they're not major problems um, that the industry has, has, has seen here. It's really um, minor problems, things that range from, typically range from, you know, uh, we powered it up, but we're not getting the full power or, um, you know, having some issues possibly with uh, negotiating for multiple devices receiving power. Um, maybe it's not receiving the right power. It's not being configured the right way. There's various different um, installation um, concerns around deploying PoE. And, and the, at the end of the day, customers just want it to work right out of the box. Plug and play, take these two devices, a power source, a power device, plug them together, and you expect them to work. So how do we get to that point? Um, that's where the, the PoE certification program comes into play. We looked at the challenges associated with the different terminology, the different um, potentially interpretations of the IEEE specifications, and we came up with a rigorous uh, test plan um, promoted by um, the members of the Ethernet Alliance Power of Ethernet Subcommittee and adopted by the industry um, laboratories for testing uh, to certify PoE products. And that certification applies both to the power source equipment or PSEs, as well as the powered devices or PDs. And what we came up with is you see on the far right of your screen is a logo um, program that's a trademarked logo that gets applied directly to the products or can be applied to uh, online documentation or packaging material or any any of the other promotional um, documentation around the products. But where it comes into to be most useful is directly on the product. So when you have a, for example, a switch or power injector that provides that power source um, and you want to know if it has enough power or will it be interoperable when you connect to this lighting fixture or uh, this access point or camera. Um, both of those devices, when certified, will be able to use these logos and you'll be able to identify which one is the power source and which one is the power device by looking at the arrows that you see going in and out of the boxes, as well as identifying the class or the power level that it supports. Um, and so again, there's, there's various different class logos that you'll see. They range from one to eight, eight being the most uh, power delivery uh, capable up to 99 watts and one being the, the most restrictive um, uh, as a power source or as a, as a power device. And then the industry consolidated these terms now as, as a new branding name. So getting rid of all the PoE++ and, and these other various names around uh, extensions for PoE, we, we try to simplify it by calling it now PoE1 uh, and PoE2. And what those mean, simply PoE1 is the first generation of two pair power delivery which is inclusive of the IEEE 802.3 AT and AF standards. And then PoE2 is the, the four pair power delivery um, system, which is also backwards compatible, um, but it's it ranges from classes one through eight. So it's all inclusive of all um, standards moving forward. So those are the new terminologies and the new logos that you'll start to see in the marketplace for identifying uh, certified PoE products. Next slide. And so <clears throat> just a quick overview of the certification process um, and, and how these how these companies and, and participants would uh, obtain um, certification approvals. Essentially, they, they have to uh, test to a rigorous test plan, which I mentioned before is something that the Ether Alliance put together, um, runs through uh, the original test plan was somewhere around um, 30 or 40 
pages of tests and the Gen 2 test plan that we just recently launched is um, upwards of uh, 80 to 90, 90 pages now, something like that. Um, so we've almost doubled the amount of testing um, between the two programs. And that, that was, and so that test plan is, is very thoroughly thought out. Um, and so you obtain this test plan, the products would go through testing, which can be done either at an independent um, third-party test lab, like um, UNH IOL, uh, or uh, can be tested uh, under a fir first-party approved test lab, say a company like, um, like Aruba could do an internal testing and then send those reports in. And uh, once those test reports are submitted, the EA will review, uh, audit, and then approve those. And once those products are approved, there's a publicly available product registry that hosts all uh, PSE and PD products, whether Gen 1 or Gen 2, um, will be listed on the product registry uh, as showing a, approved for the logo certification. And so with that, um, here's a few links. If you're interested in, in going to the product registry, you can click on that first bit.ly link there, and that will send you to uh, the full list of all certified products. Um, the second link there is to the Ethernet Alliance uh, POE test plan. And then the, the final link there is just for um, general updates and news. Um, you can see our latest press releases and, and, and news updates that are, that are coming out. So wanted to share that information with everyone and hopefully um, you'll find it useful. And uh, if you have any questions, I think uh, we can answer some of those on this call today uh, once we get to the, uh, the end of the presentation. Thank you, David. Okay, this is Mark. And as I mentioned, I was going to make you hear a little bit about uh, power over ethernet cabling. And um, the story we want to tell here is that, you know, POE operation is, you know, based on the fact that you got a, a power sourcing equipment, power device, and that the powered device completes the current loop that allows the, uh, the DC power to uh, flow through the cabling and that allows the device to work. Now, as David talked about, there are two and four pair implementations of POE and the current needs to be very well balanced across all the different wires used. In this case, across all four wires, if it's two pairs, across all eight wires, if it's four pairs, and one of the problems that you'll see, and the designers can tell you more about this than you'll probably see in the field, is that the cabling has to have low resistance. That seems pretty obvious, right? Because if there's too much resistance, the cable will heat up, the resistance then goes up, and then the power starts to not get through, and that can be a problem. The other issue, though, that is maybe not quite as apparent is that the resistance needs to be balanced across the pairs, because otherwise what will happen is You'll have one pair trying to carry more power than another, or even within a pair, if one wire has more resistance, too much more resistance than the other, you'll end up with the transformers getting saturated in the power device. And while the powering may work, then the data won't be able to get through. And in fact, this is well known. Um, let's see if we get to this. If you look at the ANSI 568, the cabling specs, and the IEEE 802.3 specs, you'll find that they do specify DC loop resistance and DC resistance unbalanced within a pair. So they know that that is important. But what's something that's interesting that happened is that those measurements are not included in the field test standard. So while the IEEE and the TIA realize these are really important in the cable, they said, yeah, you know, you can test this in the field if you want or not. Part of the reason that they did that is because it's very difficult to test it in the field. In fact, even ISO includes that uh, loop resistance that says the unbalance is optional. And as I said, part of this is because this, these sorts of field tests were very difficult to do back when these standards were adopted. So they said, you know what, don't worry about it in the field. The cabling is probably going to be okay. Now, the problems you can get if you have resistance issues with the cable is that the cable can overheat, that can be a problem. You can, power can get, can become intermittent or maybe not even available at all if there's too much resistance. And as I mentioned, you can also have data loss as an issue. Now, as I mentioned, they said, well, you know what? 
probably be okay as long as the cable is specified in test for this. But one of the things that you'll find out is that it's not just the cable quality, it's the workmanship. And you're probably all familiar with the problem, say, of, of using um, maybe connectors that are designed for solid cable with stranded cable or the other way around. You don't get as good a connection. There's a little bit too much resistance, or sometimes there's a punch down that maybe doesn't go all the way through, but you've got enough contact for a connection, but it's maybe a little higher resistance than it needs to be. And that's that's where you can run into these problems, even if the cable is good, even if you use good quality cable, unlike the copper clad aluminum there on the right. And definitely, I'm, I'm sure nobody on this line would ever use any of that stuff. So there are three resistance measurements that we recommend should be made in the field. The first one is the loop resistance. It's just the resistance within the pair. That should be less than 25 ohms. And then you get the resistance on balance, which is comparing one pair against the other three pairs. Well, there's actually six different measurements that are made there. And finally, pair resistance, which is the difference in resistance between the two wires. Now, you look at all these calculations and you think, yeah, I don't have time for that. Well, the good news is, is that if you're using a tester, and in fact, the good news is, is that we make a field tester that does this. And in fact, there are other testers on the market now that can measure resistance. And so we recommend that you do that if you're installing for POE. On our tester, it's a simple matter of when you're selecting your test limit, just select plus POE. And you'll see for every link type, so like you got a permanent link for CAT 6A, you also get a permanent link with plus POE. And what that means is we're adding these optional measurements that aren't required in the standard but they're based off the IEEE and TIA standards for the cabling. And when you do that, when you run your tests, nothing is really any different as far as the operator's concerned, but you'll get results for loop unbalance, pair to pair unbalance, and unbalance within a pair. I said those in the wrong order, but anyway, you get it. So the good news is it's very easy to make those measurements um, by just selecting that. And as I said, we recommend that when you're installing POE, especially if you're going to use some of the higher power that uses all four pairs. And it's really at very little extra cost. It, it makes the test take less than a second longer and you get a simple pass fail result. So that's something we've built into our testers. And I said, even if you're using somebody else's tester, it's something good to look for. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Eric and he's gonna talk a little bit about installing and troubleshooting and maybe talk about our great uh, a great new product that uh, it has something new to talk about. So take it away, Eric. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. So going over kind of the installing troubleshooting PoE devices, we kind of touched on some of the issues that can occur when installing a PoE device in David's part of the presentation. So going forward, I wanted to kind of go through a couple of case studies of installing a PoE device and how our solution could potentially fix them. The first of which is going to be a security camera not working. So say the, the cabling has been completely certified, just as Mark mentioned before, running it through a resistance unbalance and resistance test to verify that the cabling is not the issue. You know, the workmanship is good. Everything tested out fine there. But for some reason, the uh, access control or those guys security is not able to have a camera that's been installed work. Now, it could be an outside one, like in this uh, picture here, that might have a heater in it, so it might require more PoE. It's just not working. Now, the technician can take down that camera, put in a new one, which like goes up and down the ladder. A lot of issues that might occur with that, or just they might not even have access to a second camera. Now, you could go to all the way back to the switch if the cameras still aren't working, but that could be 50 meters away. It could be in a data center that is technically locked up and you have to wait for access in order to get in there. So if you can't get access to the switch, you have to contact IT and it's a lot of waiting time for IT to respond, especially if, even if you have to put in a ticket. So really there's a lot of time that's being wasted waiting to get just one camera installed. Now with our solution, the Microscanner POE, a technician can right at that point where he's plugging the ethernet cabling into the camera and simply just plug in the micro scanner poe and it automatically will tell you what's going on with the poe class that's being done or being provided by the switch via lldp negotiation so 
in this specific example, when you plugged in the Mike Skinner PoE, you press the PoE button after it detects that there's a PoE connection at the end, and it will pull it up and tell you what class it is. In this situation, it's only pulling up class four. You know that on the packaging of that camera specifically, it has an EA certification and it needs at least five or above. So from there, the technician has the information they need to call IT and tell them just to reconfigure the switch port or plug it into or plug it into a different switch that is able to provide more power to that specific camera. And on to the next case study, we touched a little bit on access points as well. Um, we know again that the cabling has been certified. There are no issues with it. The microscanner POE can do a wire map test as well as a distance to a fall. So if there isn't a certified line, but you're simply testing it, plug in the microscanner POE and it will tell you immediately if it is connected to a switch, the cable's good. If it isn't, it will, spe it will uh, specify exactly what fault that is. Now, if we're plugging into an access point, we know the cable's good. But the access point is sporadic at best in the work environment that they're in. We have, again, the employees are trying to get their work done, but it's hard to do that when the access point isn't working. Again, you could swap out, you could swap out the access point for a new one if that's even available. Now you could also go to the switch to help resolve that. But again, you need to go into the data center, and that can be a time-consuming process all on its own. So it's still not working. It might be the switch, you still have to call IT, you still have to wait. There's a lot of time that's being wasted here. One of the main pain points that David pointed out was that the device isn't working the first time it plugs it in. And we can see that that's a major issue. The micro scanner, all you have to do is plug it in. And once it says that it's connected to a switch, it automatically runs a test up to 10 gig to tell you what the bandwidth is. So say that a wireless access point needs a two and a half gig connection. But when the mic scanner is plugged in, it's only showing 100 megabytes on the, just this shown in the picture. Obviously that's the issue. Again, the technician has the information they need to go directly to IT and tell them what the issue is without any further testing or swapping out devices or waiting. They have the information they need right there to submit a trouble ticket and the, the issue can be resolved. So here's the micro scanner POE. So it displays the power in the watts, as I mentioned, with the negotiation via LLDP, provides class up to going from class zero to eight, does port speeds up to 10 gigabytes. So it does 10, 100, 1,000, 2.5, 5 gig, and 10 gig. It'll tell you the length of the cable. Um, it will do a wire map to detect various miswires, split pairs, and universal shorts. Basically, it val helps validate workmanship when a certification test is not necessarily available. Also, if you're trying to figure out where that cable might be in the data closet, if you're able to get in there and do the work, we, there's a toning option that you can tone from the far end. You simply hit tone and with our IntelliTone or with our Pro 3000 series of probes, you can identify which cable it is within that bundle just to quickly identify which one to swap out. And I'm proud to announce that the Microscanner POE has been certified by the Ethernet Alliance. So really, it's ready to go when you're ready. Thank you, Eric. So now this is the time when uh, we've got, if you've got any questions, you can, uh, you can send them in. Uh, one of the questions we got is, will there be a recording of this? Yes, there will be. Um, there's a question here. This one's actually maybe for David. The question was, when do you see the new POE1 and POE2 designations being implemented? Good question. So the, they're actually being implemented today. Um, the rollout of that um, just started in the first half of this year um, where industry um, adopted the POE1, POE2 designations, but products are starting to come out to market um, today. Um, that indicate the, the new POE1, POE2 designations. Um, so you should start to see that rolling out. It, it, the adoption rate's gonna take a little bit longer, um, obviously for, for several products in the industry, just because um, those products have been uh, used to uh, branding the old terminology. 
Um, but over time, I, I'd certainly say within the next couple of years, you'll start to see most, if not all products, uh, moving in the direction of branding PoE1, PoE2. Okay, let's see. Um, another question we got was, um, I think we've got somebody out there who owns a uh, microscanner PoE because they were asking, uh, I've had mine for a while, is it compliant with the Ethernet Alliance or is it, uh, is it certified to work? as you know as the apparently the new ones are eric i'll let you look at that one okay thanks mark so yes the um the microscanner poe was designed alongside the ethernet alliance to really figure out what the specifics would be that are going into the poe2 standard and everything going for bt um so we didn't have to change anything within the, the equipment to have EAA certified. So the tester that we may have been purchased on day one of the microscanner POE being available, and one you could buy tomorrow and from then on into the future, are the exact same tester, and they're all going to be EA certified. Yeah, I'll mention that our, our engineers are uh, have become a little bit insufferable walking around uh, talking about how they got certified without having to change anything, and they're feeling uh, pretty pretty proud of themselves. So. Uh, Hopefully that'll die down and they can get back to work and stop high-fiving each other about passing it on the first try with no changes whatsoever. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, okay, another question we've got, uh, Eric, this is a good one for you is, um, can you tone a cable with this if the line's plugged in, and I assume they mean plugged into a switch? Yes, you can. Using the, um, the Intellitone, toning capabilities in the microscanner PoE, as well as an Intellitone Pro 200 probe, you can tone directly into a switch. It uses a spe it doesn't use an analog tone and signal um, that you might find on like plain old telephone systems using like a test set. Um, it uses a form of packet capture and loss, et cetera, that uh, signal that's sent along that cable to be used in a live plugged in uh, cable. Yeah, I, I think that's an important thing to point out is that the microscanner will work with the Intellitone, which is our own proprietary probe, and also with standard analog probes like the Pro 3000, but that feature will only work with the Intellitone. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, good. Um, another question that's come up is, uh, how long of a cable can, we, uh, can you test with the uh, microscanner? I believe that is a thousand feet. Play up the I, right now. I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, you can always click on the link that I posted in the chat and go to the page and look it up. Um, yeah, the actual the length test at maximum is actually fifteen hundred feet, so about okay. four hundred and sixty meters. So it's actually you can use it for both the. Uh, you know, for well, obviously for datacom cabling, but other reasons, other purposes as well. Also, even to, to chuck a spool, it's uh, it's handy for that as well. I would I would guess that's one of the reasons we made it so long. Um, there's also a question about there's two micro scanners. Could you explain the difference between the two different micro scanner models? Yeah, for sure. So the micro scanner two came out a number of years ago. Um, that is strictly done to test. Uh, up to one gigabyte speeds for its bandwidth testing. And then it really is just a fault finding tester. Um, so it's a verification. It doesn't have the same capabilities as the Microscanner POE for network um, and switch negotiation. So yeah. the LLBP and everything was built into the Microscanner POE. So you can think of it sort of as like a Microscanner 3, but it's more like just the younger brother of the Microscanner 2. Yeah, and one thing I know the the, the older micro scanner also has a, a coax port, which is something the the PoE we had to give up to uh, to squeeze it to squeeze it in there. But if you, if you if coax is an important part of your job, then the old micro scanner might be a better choice for you. But for most people working in datacom, that's not so important anymore. So, sure. All right. Um, Okay, here's a question. I'm not sure exactly how to answer this. It's a good question. Is um, we this customer currently has a DTX 1800, which is a product we've sold for many years. And uh, would this product replace that or work with that product? Eric, I'd say it's not really a full replacement because it doesn't do a certification or 
create any sort of a report. But uh, any yeah. comments on that? Yeah, the true replacement for a DTX-1800 is going to be the DSX-5000 or the DSX-8000. Yeah. Um, just because it does do the full range of testing. The Microscanner POE, while a very capable tester, does not provide a certification report, nor does it test to IEEE standards like the DSX-8000 would. Okay, good. Another question, kind of in that same vein, is that can you save results with the Microscanner? Unfortunately, no, the Microscanner POE does not save results on it. It is meant as a simple a troubleshooting tester. Um, if you're looking to save results, you could go to the Cable IQ or to the DSX 8000. Right, right, okay. And then actually, this is a very, this is a question that we get a lot of questions around this sort of a thing. There are some cables such as, uh, you know, Game Changer, and I know Annexter and Belden also have cables that uh, are designed to operate in excess of the typical TIA and ISO 100 meter limits. And will this tester still pass that cable? Now, the first point is, is that the microscanner doesn't give you a pass or fail. And considering it'll work with longer lengths, I don't see any reason why it would not work with those longer cables. Do you have any experience with that, Eric? So we did actually test alongside with the Annex with Annexter's utility grade cabling that was mm. done. Um, so the microscanner PoE does work with that at those longer lengths. Um, so yes, we tested with them, um, but obviously it doesn't do a full test report and just test the IEEE standards of that because it simply will do a test of length, does the wire map, et cetera, that really just does the troubleshooting. Yeah, so it, it should work fine with those cables because as we said, it doesn't do a pass or fail, but in terms of making sure it's wire mapped correctly, and the length is what you think it is, and there's no breaks, uh, we're, we're fine. Okay, yeah. that's good. I hadn't thought about that. Oh, this is one, I, you know, I've heard pros and cons on this. This is a question, is shielded cable recommended for PoE cabling? Uh, either David or, um, or uh, Eric, if you have any comments on that, I have some thoughts, but not much. As our POE expert, I will give it over to David. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so, I, I mean, it's somewhat dependent on your application. The, the, in general, it's not a requirement. Um, is there a benefit to using shielded cabling? Um, and again, in some applications, yes, uh, there, there is definitely a benefit. The key with using shielded cabling is you wanna make sure that the, um, that the shield is terminated and grounded properly. That would be uh, my recommendation. We, we sometimes uh, see implementations where um, customers might be running uh, network cabling out to outdoor equipment, like an IP camera mounted outdoors, for example, um, or an access point outdoors, and they use a shielded cable thinking that the shielding is going to provide some protection to the outdoor elements, um, mainly um, uh, minimizing the amount of uh, noise being picked up, which is one of the benefits of a shielded cable. But you have to make sure that 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 the devices are properly grounded, meaning the power source or switch is properly grounded to earth, as well as the outdoor or or in device, whether it's indoor or outdoor, um, is also properly uh, grounded um, in order to make sure that that shield is going to be grounded uh, through that interconnect. So that that's my recommendation there. Um, otherwise, um, shielded cabling again uh, is useful in 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 routing network cabling through um, intra-building or um, around high switching um, operating um, equipment like industrial um, equipment that's going to generate um, a fair amount of noise. So if you wanted to protect your data data lines um, through the network cable, shielded, shielded cabling is beneficial for that. Otherwise, standard category five cabling works just fine for PoE. Okay. Good. I think we've gotten through all of the questions. So um, I guess the one thing I'm gonna, I will wrap it up with is, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about what, uh, you know, how, how to make sure you've got a good installation. And uh, we really kind of talk about three steps that, uh, that can help you make sure you, that your POE installation is going to work properly. Obviously, choosing Ethernet Alliance certified devices, they're just starting to come on the market now, but I think it's important to keep your eyes open for those. Uh, that could make your life uh, a little bit easier. 
Um, certifying the cabling for resistance performance. It's an easy step when you're installing the cable to just make sure that you check that resistance performance as well and make sure it passes the, uh, the appropriate limits. And then having a troubleshooter on hand is very, very handy. It could save a lot of time in uh, you know, walking back and forth, trying to figure out why something isn't working the first time. And if it's Ethernet Alliance certified, that's probably even better. We've got a uh, white paper that covers this we just released, which talks about these three steps. And uh, there's a link here on the screen. And also I uh, posted that link in the chat window for you in case you'd uh, would like to see that. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, David for joining us and Eric as well. And of course, thank all of you for attending. It's, it's quite something to see that really nobody's dropped off of this. So I guess it's a, a topic that you're all very, very interested in. So uh, I think, thank you for your attendance. And if you have any other questions, you can reach out to me. I'm mark.mullins, M-U-L-L-I-N-S, at flukenetworks.com. And I can make sure that uh, your questions get routed to the right place. And uh, I'm going to help you out. And let's keep that POE revolution going. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.